a mesma coisa que eu estou falando. Não há uma alternativa que o que eu estou a dizer. Eu não quero fazer isso. Eu não quero dar a você sobre a sua vacação. Então, eu quero dar a você sobre a vacação. Então, eu vou dar a você no dia que nós voltamos. Isso será isso. Nós vamos ter esse exame depois da vacação, o seu primeiro exame. Então, se você está aqui, você vai ter uma semana de escrever. E você vai ter perguntas sobre Engels, Kowski, Bernstein, Lennon, Marx, and this class theory that we're doing now, and I hope Novik as well. Okay. So those will be your questions that you'll be able to ask. Yes. Um, next. Okay, folks. I have questions on the following. Now, here's what we're going to do today, and then I'll come back to these questions. We're going to examine the difference between a capitalist and a communist factor, a surplus arrangement. And asking questions, so what's the difference, differences between capitalism and communist factory from this surplus approach? But before I do that, okay, I want to go back since I got questions on this. The same question arises again. And again. Suppose there were a collective ownership of the means of production in society. I don't think we did this. Suppose there were a collective ownership. Just like Engels want, wants, wants and the rest of these characters. Don't get confused. This surplus labor approach is different from what I'm now going to do. You're going to get this difference. Okay. So I'm going back. Suppose, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Engels, Kowski, and Bernstein. Suppose these characters get what they desire, which is collective ownership of means of production, holding aside the planning. What impact would that have? What difference does it make? That was my opinion. People keep asking me, what difference would it make? So let me do that in my class. And let's take our society as the example. So I'm, I'm not advocating for this or advocating against it. One, all I'm trying to do is analyze it. Yes, sir. Uh, before we get started, just to reiterate, so the example we passed out uh, Tuesday after. Yes, sir. We'll have one week to do it. Yes, sir. Okay. That's correct. We'll have a full week. And all the questions will be once we've discussed it. Okay, you ready now? Suppose, suppose the national output of the United States, what's called net national product, is $13 trillion. That's the total value of all the goods and services produced in one year. Just one year. It's an enormous sum. So this encompasses all the wages and all the profits of business. Old big pot, roughly 13 trillion bucks. Economists, let's call this what? The total of value of goods and services. Economists like to play with, and for those of you who have studied economics, you know, something called the capital output ratio. The capital output ratio. And people, economists often claim that that number is three, roughly, in the United States and other countries as well. What does this mean? Well, let's solve the equation. This says A is equal to 3Y, or one-third A is equal to Y. This says that in order to produce 13 trillion dollars of wealth, you need uh, nine, 39 trillion of capital. That is, I've got my numbers right. So this is called in economics a production function. Output depends upon, in this case, capital, and you need three dollars of capital to produce a dollar. Very, if you want to produce a dollar of, of output, you need three dollars worth of what? Machines, raw materials, tools. So I'm not counting your refrigerators, I'm not counting stocks and bonds. What capital refers to only is the total value of the means of production. 
the United States today. Suppose we pass a law, a new law in the United States. It would have to obviously be um, interpreted by uh, the Supreme Court to see if this were constitutional, but suppose it were. And this law said that if you are a citizen of the United States, you are a collective owner of $39 trillion. That's what collective ownership is. So if you're a citizen of this country, prove that, whatever, then when you're born, you would get not just your social security card, but you also would get a number, but you would also get a certificate, which says that you, you are a collective owner of 39 uh, trillion dollars. Let's see what that certificate would be worth. So, 39 trillion, and there's 300 million people. So, when you're born, you would get a certificate from the federal government, besides your social security card, and it would be worth $130,000 U.S. You're a part owner of America, corporate America. You can see this might be controversial, you know, legally possible. Certainly, culturally possible. Once I'm not, I was just explaining to you, it's taking me two and a half minutes, so it's not that difficult. Suppose the interest rate, or the, if you want, the return on capital is five uh, percent. It's probably much higher, but let's take a reasonable number: five percent over our history. So you own this, and you get. That's your certificate, and you you get five percent of that. By the way, who gets it? Every person in the United States. I don't want to lose that. I divided it by three hundred million. Every child, every adult gets this. So you would get sixty-five hundred dollars a year. So the, whoever appropriates that profits, the surplus, would have to give you a dividend, a social dividend of $6,500 a year that comes out of the surplus. You would get a check each and every year, so long as this stays at this and this stays at this, and they could change. But then you get a check for $6,500. So let me see, 18, 65, please check my difference there. So by the time you go to college, 18 years, if you didn't spend it, you would have amassed $117,000 after 18 years. That would roughly pay for a good deal of your college education. Plus, you might be able to get a car out of this too. That's kind of nice. And you get it for the rest of your life. So you die. That's what collective ownership means quantitatively. You decide your qualitative dimension to this. That's why people get intrigued with this. That's why there's so much literature on this, because wow. Is that $6,500 a year uh, supposed to be like what you're going to live on? Um, is that, how does that relate to the possible uh, earnings consumption? That's what it's like. You see the question? Do you hear the question? It's perfectly reasonable. You get it because you're a citizen. And it doesn't depend upon anything else. Then being a 
the citizen of the land. Israel's right as a citizen. As amended by the U.S. Constitution or whatever we say, this is a new Bill of Rights. This is a revolutionary activity. See from your faces and how quiet you are, you've never heard this before. This is what Engels and Kautsky and the rest of these characters are after. Tell me something, my friend, although I don't know. If you got this $6,500 a year, would you work to do something else? Or would you take the $6,500 and talk to Vermont for a month and eat mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> He would work, I would too. And the reason, I don't know about him, the reason I would work and continue to work is because the influence of my parents, but in particular my mother. She taught me and she never stopped that if I didn't work, I would be called in her wonderful phraseology from the 1920s and 30s, when she was a young woman, a bum, a parasite. So since she's always in my head, even though she's dead for many years now, Escape the old determined influence upon me, and I would work too. Here you go. Your answer and my answer is even though we would have collective ownership, we highly, it would be highly likely that he and I, and I think the rest of you too, would still sell your way. And we could be exploited. This is not the only answer to exploitation, even if we have collective ownership. Any others on this? Yeah, man. Would uh, some of the kind of dividends you get from the collective ownership have to be kind of reinvested to, like, say you own part of the factory? You know, you need to keep the machines running. Well, let's not lose that theory. Yeah. Okay, I've already answered that, but let's go back and do it again. Okay, yeah, I'm going to get rid of this one. So, Cross corporate, let's assume you still have capitalism in the United States. You know, so we still have capitalism. That means that we have a surplus in capitalism for the GEs and the IBMs and the Googles and so forth. And they have to make distributions to their managers and taxes to the state, but they got a new one. They got to give this dividend to you and me. This $6,500 a year to the people who own the means of production. But they have to do that anyway. They have to give, they have to give a social dividend as we've seen. Now, could we pass a, could we get together as corporate owners, discuss the following, be properly informed, you know, we don't think, we don't want this for any given year or five years, whatever. We would rather have the corporations not do this Keep it over here, bump this, and reinvest it in R&D. Sure, why not? Do you think people would do that? Yeah. With the appropriate education, you would have people like me and you in the different offices and factories or schools, whatever it be, persuading people that that might be a wise thing to do. It's like the board of directors has to be persuaded. If you think the people on the board of directors in current capitalism are sophisticated economists, that's a joke. They hire economists and give them a cut of the surplus to advise them. So the answer is, okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Please, uh, Is there any Is there any incentives for jobs that require more education? Like being a doctor as opposed to being a Yeah, but what does that have to do with this? Well, there's not the amount of getting paid. You said pay for like doing stuff, you just get paid for that, and you just assume you just work for free. You pass a law in which you're the, I'm not sure I follow. You pass a law in which you become a part because it's 300 million of us, you become a part owner in corporate America. 
and you get sixty-five hundred dollars a year. That, are they, are then you asking me, would you still, might you still be an MD or an engineer or whatever? Do you still get paid away if you're working? Absolutely, you get paid. If you're over here and you're a manager, you get this. If you're over here and you're a worker, you get that. That doesn't stop. Absolutely. The answer is, if it's capitalism, you still get a V, and you still get a SSCP, and if you get a V, you're exploited. So let me just stop. Listen to me carefully in terms of this question. This question is really important. This exam is forthcoming. An income and or property notion of class is different from a surplus notion of class. They are not the same. It's very difficult for me to get that across to you. I understand what you're struggling with. They're not the same. It's an elephant and an ice cream cone. Those things are different. They're not the same. So, you can get a cut of the surplus of a social dividend. You could be on the right-hand side, the left-hand side, on both sides of the equation. All it means is that citizenship, irrespective of your class position, means that you get 6500 Now, if you were Mr. Engels, you would say, this here, that's the end of exploitation. And if you did that in class, I would fail. Too bad, Engels. I like the man, I think, but he would have failed. I would have given him a stamp right in that. Same thing goes for Mr. Lennon. Unfortunately, Mr. Lennon might still be better. But nonetheless, I would have done. And you will too. It's a very important question to be asked. This is changing. I'm not saying this is minor. I just we went through this is a major change. This is a change in who owns what. But that doesn't necessarily imply that it's a change in anything else in a radical revolutionary way. That's the mistake these people make. It's a mistake. Horrible mistake that was made on the 20th century. They assumed that a change in this, what I just taught you, would automatically get rid of that. That's a mistake. Let me do it one more to make that sure I can get this across. Okay? Suppose the average income in the United States is $65,000. I'm not sure what it is, but it's probably close to that. 60, 60, 65 grand a year. Now, it's very, it's distributed very unequal, so, you know, there's a tremendous uh, variance. But the 6,500, to say that's the mean. Suppose I took that, everybody in the United States is to make $6,500. Everybody's to get the same income. We got the law. And the Supreme Court said, okay, you can do it. So we passed the law in the United States. Everybody gets the same income, which is $6,500. So we get rid of this unequal distribution of income in the States. Have we gotten rid of class exploitation? That's my question. No. So class exploitation depends upon who does this necessary and surplus. That's different from the issue of property and income, or power. Once again, what I told you, I can't think of a society that has more of a egalitarian structure than the states. I understand we have problems in the states. We still have problems in terms of power. I'm not arguing that we don't. It's just that we've gone probably as further along that line than any other society in terms of taking it all seriously and trying to deal with the inequities of who has power over whom in the United States. It's really quite dramatic. Does that mean the end of exploitation? No. Yes? Wait, before you do that, the gentleman would ask me a question. Are you kind of okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, man. Go ahead. I might be getting a little ahead here, but if you, instead, I mean, as you have this, you know, this distribution of ownership, but you also distribute Yeah, net national product amongst the, the, the workforce, would that 
be a, a non exploitative No, I just told you that. Even if you distribute it to the equal the goods, equal. You see, in order to let's go back again. So long as there is this equation. We have a problem. Okay? This is the, in other words, this comes first. In order to have the profits, you've got to create the profits. And then you have to ask the question who's getting that which is being produced? So, it is possible that the workers produce the surplus in the states, say, let's say, every single year, uh, I don't know, say, six trillion every year. And then you pass a new law, and all of that gets equally divided. But you still ask, the, interrogate the question: Who gets that initial six trillion of surplus? Let me do another one for you, which I did a long time ago. I told you when I read that. I think I read the Communist Manifesto for you. I think I told you that the fourth item that Marx and Engels of this revolutionary document were they, they, they produced in the 1840s, one of them was progressive taxes, which we have in the United States. That might have been the second item on their list. I can't remember. We have it. Marx is very clear on this. You have to ask what's the source of the income that is going to be progressively taxed? He's all for progressive taxation. It's not his object of analysis. What he's after is the source of the income. The V plus the SV, which adds up to the Y that's being redistributed. So what he wants to abolish is the workers producing more in value than they're getting paid. That's what he's after. When you come back to me, you say, listen. Is it possible that you could have the workers in the position to get their own surplus? I've been teaching you that. And still have an inequality of income distribution? Yes. So the inequality of income distribution is not to be conflated with, mixed up with, this inequality in class in terms of surplus. That's what's very difficult for me to get across here. That's what that difference is what was missed in the 20th and 21st centuries to this day. So that's what Marx added to the analysis. That organization of surplus. Not that he was indifferent for property and income. He was concerned. But that wasn't his analysis. His analysis, his point of entry was who produces and who gets this service. What else? Before I do my example here. Okay, then the example. I'll, I'll try and uh, come back and answer these good questions that you're asking. From last time, we have a factory or factories that makes no difference. The workers are getting paid a value for their labor power of one billion dollars. I don't care, whatever the numbers are. So the capitalists pay these workers a billion. Why? Because they want their labor power. They want their capacity to work. So workers sell their labor power and they get its value, which is one billion. Got the labor power, and the workers get its value in the market, value in exchange of one billion dollars. Okay. That's what the capitalists give up. That's what the workers get. One billion. Suppose from last time the workers go out. Remember this? To remind you, not last Thursday. They go. They love apples. That's what they want. And so they spend fifty cents on apples. So they get two billion apples. 
So this is their consumption of apples. It's the value of their consumption to reproduce their labor power so they can continue to sell it. So this is the price of an apple. They're buying apples, who the workers, and this is the amount, the quantum of apples that they purchase. Would this be big enough? Yeah, I think it's possible. I just want to make sure it's consistent. So this is the value of consumption of apples, which is a billion dollars, because that's what they get paid. Now I'm assuming they don't save anything. So we, now we can ask the question, the last long time ago, okay, how much labor does it take to produce these apples that the workers buy? The answer was, well, this is the necessary labor in apple production. That's the labor that's required to produce these apples to sustain these workers who are selling their labor power to whomever. Automobile production. Suppose it, you know, it's silly, but suppose this took four hours. So these workers go to work. These workers, so this is four hours, this is the value of the consumer goods. So the, the total quantum of labor, social labor, that's required to produce these apples to sustain the workers so they can continue to be workers. And the question is, okay, what do the capitalists get? Suppose the capitalists get from this investment. Well, what would they get back? The workers go to work, and suppose the workers work for four hours. By this logic, they would be producing a billion dollars, because that's what the four hours produces, the way I've done it, you know, set it up. Then what would the capitalists get? The capitalists, suppose this, don't put this down on your paper, because then you just have to erase it. But suppose the capitalists got from them four hours of labor, and the labor yielded uh, one billion dollars. That's what I have to do. set it up. What would the capitalists get? This is what the capitalists. This is what the capitalists. This is their cost. This is what they get in value. So, what's left for the capitalists? The capitalists give a billion to, to, to the workers, and the capitalists get from the workers one billion. So what's left for the capitalists? Nothing. So this number has to be bigger than this number for there to be profits. Otherwise, as you nicely put it, it's nothing. So the workers, whatever they do, they're going to yield more than a billion dollars. Otherwise, it's nothing for the capitalists. Suppose the workers go to work, and they work for 4.00001. Is there money for the capitalists? I mean, profits. Yes, but it's very tiny. Notice something. If you give the workers a billion, then the capitalists are interested in making this number bigger and bigger. What is this number? This is the use value of the labor power. It's the actual labor performed. Suppose the use value of labor power is eight hours of labor. Length of the work day in the United States, roughly. And suppose that yields $2 billion in value. That's what the workers add in value. In labor terms, they work for eight hours, and they yield over the, the workday $2 billion. Is there a surplus value for the capitalists? How much? $1 billion. That's the source of their profit. So the workers go to work, the use value of the labor power is eight hours, that yields $2 billion in value, if you subtract the wages from it, you get a billion dollars of surplus extra value. And the capitalists get it 
because they bought the labor power, and the workers go to work, and under the law, whatever the workers produce, which is $2 billion worth of products, belong to the capitalists. That's private profit. It doesn't belong to the workers. It's like the fact the workers produced it. And under the law, production doesn't give you legal ownership. So whoever bought that labor power, and under the law, gets the use value, and what the use value produces, which is, in this case, $2 billion of value. That belongs to the buyer of labor. In labor terms, then, the worker goes to work for, let's do it over here, the worker goes to work for eight hours, and produces, you can see, $2 billion of value. So the worker gets, let's see now, the worker gets, quit using our numbers, after four hours, the workers, after four hours, the workers have produced enough to cover their wages. The workers, after four hours, the workers produce one bit. That's equal to the value of their labor power. Right? Because that's the quantum of labor, necessary labor. That's the amount of labor required to produce the means of subsistence, the consumer goods, to sustain these workers. But the workers don't go home. They work four more hours, four more hours of surplus labor, and they produce another billion dollars. It goes to the buyer of labor power. Why? Because the buyer gets its complete and total use value in eight hours. So over the eight hour day, over the eight hour day, the workers produce two billion. So over the eight hours, the workers' labor yields two ace quarter each hour, giving us two billion at the end of the work day. The workers go to work for eight hours. They get paid. <coughs> one over eight. They get paid one billion dollars in wages. So this is their wage rate per hour. One over eight. One buck over the total eight hours. Eight hours. Sorry. That's the wage per hour, you know, the wage rate. So there's a difference between what they get paid per hour and what they yield per hour, which is one eighth. Two eighths minus one eighth. So they yield a surplus of one eighth every single hour times eight is your extra surplus of two billion, uh, one billion dollars. So Marx says, this is crazy. These workers, every single hour, are doing unpaid labor. They're being exploited every single hour over the eight hours. They're producing two, they're getting uh, two A's, they're getting paid one A's. They're producing a quarter of a billion every hour. They're only getting paid half of it, one eighth. So they're doing unpaid labor. And they're happy to do it. Next question. This is the second time that we've done this. And you do really need it to ask one of the questions on the exam. So this is the surplus labor approach to class. There's a class of individuals who produce a quarter of a billion every hour, but only get paid an eighth every hour. That's class exploitation. They're being exploited. Every single hour, of every workday, of every week, month, year. That's a lot of money across all the factories in the United States. And they're not aware of it. 
They're not, they, they don't have the understanding of this. It's very difficult. Not difficult intrinsically, because we live in a society which says there's no, there's no exploitation. It's very difficult to deal with someone telling you there's exploitation when there's no exploitation. You can talk about all your life. That ended with feudalism and slavery. So Marx claims that exploitation exists in capitalism in a different way than it did in feudalism and slavery. And you have to be conscious, aware of it, to do something about it. Just like any other problem in your life, you can't get rid of it until you're aware of it. So this is therapeutic. Make workers aware that they're producing more in value than they're getting paid in value to deal with that problem. Next step. Suppose that also, to produce this product, these automobiles, whatever it is, suppose that the capitalists require not just eight hours of labor, which they get by buying labor power, not just that, so they need, in addition to this, they also need another input, or inputs. They need tools, raw materials, and so forth and so forth. So they have to go out and buy raw materials and tools in addition to labor power. Suppose then they go and have to purchase, in this example, they have to purchase $2 billion of machinery. Marx calls that, remember C, capital, constant capital. Well now, you've got your C, you've got your V, one billion, you've got your profits, surplus, so the product has to be sold for a value, a, a worth, of two, three, four. And when the capitalist does that, the capitalist covers the cost of the raw materials and the machines used up to produce these, whatever the product is, <laughs> covers the wages and realizes the profit of one billion dollars. So, here is the, here's what workers add the value. Here's what the machines add the value. And here's an Marxian accounting for value. Everything that's sold contains with it not just the value of the machines used up to produce this stuff, but also exploitation. I mean, you don't see it, and you don't think it when you go to Whole Foods. That wonderful store that, you know, that, that, that uh, hustles the environmentalism, that, ple that pleasant and wonderful place. You don't see it there, but there, you know, out here in Hazard, there, and they don't think of any other capitalists. The really? exploitation of every apple, every head of lettuce, every can of tuna. Is that a nice corporation for them? There's no question it is. Does it pay higher wages than its competitors? There's no question it does. Do people love to work there? I know that. They do. In, in almost every single way, it's a progressive firm. That doesn't take away from exploitation. Okay, next and last, this is the crucial step now. Suppose in this factory, that you just had in the black room, we have the following, and I really underscore this, radical changes. Radical changes. These are really important changes. Number one, suppose workers now in this factory, and you can extend it to all the factories, suppose workers now own the means of production. So you pass a law, you change the culture, you pass the economics that when you're born and you're a citizen, you own, or if you go to work for this company, you own its means, you own its tools, you own its stuff, its seat. You own it. You own the company. As a shareholder, you own the company. 
does that necessarily and automatically imply the end of this? The, the absence of this splitting. No. There's no deduction that you can deploy from saying, okay, collective ownership is necessarily going to eliminate this. This could remain. It could even be enhanced, for God's sakes, since they're different. You know, if this is a cupcake and the other one is a lion, those are different. It's possible you could even get enhanced Come on. Come on. Enhanced exploitation from collective ownership. The workers may work even harder, doing more labor, nine hours. But you get more surplus. Why? Because they are a collective owner. Suppose workers have power. So that's the that's the ownership business. Suppose workers now have power over their work lives, which they which they really do have at Whole Foods. It's a company that really does push workers' control. <coughs> do they necessarily also appropriate their own service? No. That's what the Japanese capitalists figured out in post-World War II. That is, if they had a revolution, literally, a radical offering of power to give more and more power to workers, it could Increase the surplus for Toyota. It did. Empowerment is one thing. Whatever you think about it, good or bad, empowerment is one thing. Exploitation from the surplus labor is a different thing. Third, suppose we had complete planning. We abolished markets. Suppose we had a bunch of state planets setting administered prices for both all these inputs and the outputs. Does that necessarily imply the abolition of the difference between use and exchange value labor power and such that the workers <coughs> get their own surplus? No! If you put all this together, that's a, a, a really a, a devastating criticism of Mr. Engels and Mr. Kalski, Mr. Bernstein, and Mr. Lane. It's one from the left, not the right. Was taking their work very seriously and it's saying that unlike these gentlemen that we've studied here before, that even if you had a revolution of power, a revolution in ownership, and a revolution in markets, that doesn't necessarily imply the end of class exploitation, which is what they want. They all want a classless society. Unfortunately, they deduce, starting with Mr. Engels, a classless society from the re revolution in ownership, markets, and power. That was the mistake, it was a horrible mistake. And the tragedy of the 20th century, right up to the present. Now let's take the communist one. So let's get some. After this, and then we'll hopefully go after Suppose now we have a different kind of radical change. We're all radical. But we have a different one. Suppose in this same factory or factories, we change this. In one simple, if not trivial way, I want to trivialize this as much as I can, show you how easy this would be. Suppose what we do now, in this same example, suppose we have the workers just, they're producing the surplus. Everything is the same. They're doing the eight hours of labor. They're paying themselves uh, one billion. They're producing two billion. That is, they're, they're doing their necessary labor. They're doing labor and above, beyond it. It's four, dollars, four hours of surplus. They're working eight hours. Or they're paying themselves a billion. They're producing two. But suppose now the workers are in the position. Let's put an adjective. Workers are in the class position to appropriate their own surplus. But it's a collectivity, not as individuals. In other words, the workers get together, they produce cars. That's Mr. Angles. We did that already. But now, we, the only thing we're after, we change one process. It's an infinite set of these. We just change one. We change the class process, the 
fundamental class process such that the workers have a new kind of participation in it, in which the workers produce two. They pay themselves one, and they have an extra two that they get. That's it. Marx calls that the communist fundamental class process. That's simple, easy stuff. A new Bill of Rights, if you want, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which says, you know, we have all these political rights. This is an economic one. Workers that produce gross profits shall be the first receivers of the gross profits that they produce. Just like workers have the right to vote, bear arms, this is an economic one. So, rather than the board of directors, a small group of people getting these surpluses across the United States, you know, roughly maybe 10, 11,000 people for the 500 world largest corporations, the collectivity of workers would get the surpluses. The workers, that seems fair and just. So, if the workers are producing food, they should get to. Suppose the workers take the two. And they consume too. <laughs> they get it, they can do whatever they want with it. They consume it. They go out, they buy cars, whatever else, not just apples, or they buy more apples. Then what happens to the society? For what I thought you. Is that communism will die. Why? That's correct. Why? It's not a viable society. Why? Yeah, man. Yes. That's not the answer, though. I understand what you're doing. They've taken the surplus and they've used it for their own consumption. And he said the society will die. I agree with you. Why? Okay, and what do those what are those distributions secure that's necessary for communism to exist? They secure the social good, the politics, the economics, the culture, the non-class processes which <coughs> enable the communist fundamental class process to exist and to continue over time, not the least of which is the law I just told you. Which is what? The law says everybody that produces a surplus shall get it. We have a different law in capitalism. Those that produce the surplus don't get it. That craziness is the law. So you would have to change that new law. The people who produce the value will get it. So you've got to take a cut of the surplus and pay the legal providers of that new legal process to interpret it, to understand it, to make it part of the educational curriculum. Somebody's got to do that. So the surplus has to exist to be distributed for all the non-class processes to enable that communist surplus to exist and to continue. Let's now worry a little bit about the concrete, as I told you I would, the concreteness of this. You know, how would this be feasible? How would it work? Well, let's go back to capitalism. Okay? In a capitalist corporation like General Electric, you don't have that many people. You've got roughly you know, 20 people sitting on a board of directors getting billions of dollars every single year. First, when they sell their electrical equipment and all that stuff, do dump trucks arrive at the headquarters 
of GE probably sitting on that in New York City and dump dollar bills on this long desk in which the board of directors sit. This is it's a funny image. The board of directors who received the surplus probably never see or hold in their hands the cash. We haven't had that probably since, I don't know, 1836. But that's so nice. They don't get bags of money of this gross profit of one billion. That doesn't boom, 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 bind up on the desk or the desks or the long table of the board of directors. What they get, of course, is accounting sheets. And the accounting sheets presents them with the CBS. <coughs> so the monies have been received from the sale of electrical equipment. So they get the idea of what is a double. So, and the sale of that stuff is deposited in banks across the United States in the name of the board of directors. That's the law. It works. These 20 people or 22 people, those checking accounts are set up by the corporation, and the board of directors personifies the corporation. So legally and culturally and economically, they can write checks. The money belongs to them. In a parallel way, you would need a new kind of, I don't know, I'm guessing, new kind of culture and law and economics. If this were a communist corporation, when that stuff is sold, then those checks would be deposited across the United States. The checks would be deposited in checking accounts in the name of those workers. No problem. Banks would pay less. It would take you know, 37 seconds to change the computer input to make that change. But legally and culturally, it would be rather important. Because now the workers, under the law, the new culture, and so forth, etc., they would receive the gross sales. Just like the board of directors received. Next step. The board of directors gets an accounting sheet from who? The managers. The auditors of the corporation that audit literally figure out what the heck is going on. So they get accounting sheets, pieces of paper, computer output, whatever, which tell them what is the total sales. What is the cost of production, C plus B, and what is the gross profit? Why? Because the board of directors is legally <coughs> and economically in a position to do something with the profits. So they got to know what is the total sales and what is the C plus B. By the same logic, the workers would have to be in a position to get from their communist managers, whoever they might be, accounting sheets, so they can know the cost of production and the gross profits, so they can figure out what to do with the surplus. But notice the difference here. Small for the poor. The workers are in the position to receive the profits, and the workers are in the position to distribute that which they receive. So, when would they do this? And how would they do this? Here's how corporate boards work. Four times, roughly, four times a year, they gather together in a very tall building, probably in New York, Chicago, or Boston, <laughs> wherever the corporation, the corporate offices are located. On the very top floor, the top floor seems to be important. In a beautiful office, they receive they receive the accounting sheets every quarter. They figure out what are the profit, what are the costs. They figure out what they're going to do with the surplus. Under the law, they have to say they have to do that if there's a prudent board of directors. By the same logic, the workers in one factory or in eight million factories doesn't make any difference. They have, would have to gather together, maybe in schools, or maybe in a society would decide to build new places of appropriation and distribution, since this is rather important. They would gather there, they would receive the accounting sheets from their managers and auditors and so forth, etc., and they would have to decide, just like the corporate capitalists, what to do with their surpluses and be advised accordingly. Maybe it would say, like the, you know, they would vote. Why not? Political scientists are geniuses of figuring out different forms of voting. Maybe majority voting. Then you would tally up all the voting, and you would have, there you go, that's what you do with the surplus. Are there risks? Of course there are. Are there risks to capitalism? I remind you of the last three years. 
It's a different kind of risk. Is it a worth a risk worth taking? Because communism is that's up to Who knows? But notice the differences. The workers who produce the surplus in one capitalism, they don't get it, and they don't distribute it. In communism, the workers who produce the surplus, they get it, they distribute it. That's a different kind of freedom. The freedom from class exploitation in one, the presence of class exploitation in the other. Okay, next step on this. Okay. I want to see if I can get all these different things. <coughs> Let's go back to this uh, business of, uh, of ownership and markets. That was such a, uh, an important part of the story. Suppose we have this communist fundamental class process now in this factory or factories with all the different legal, political, and cultural conditions which have to be present, presented in order for it to exist and be reproduced. That is, communist subsumed classes that would have to secure these non class processes and get a cut of the surplus. In that kind of communist arrangement of surplus, communist workers producing it, appropriating and distributing it, communist subsumed classes, providing its non-class processes, can we then have private ownership of the means of production? Yes, I see no problem. We just established it differently. So could we have individuals in such a society privately owning the means, not collectively, private ownership? Why not? Then, for the communist workers to get access to the means of production, which are privately owned, they would have to give a cut of that surplus to the private owners. Might that create problems? Of course it might create problems. It creates a problem in capitalism. We've already talked many times about that. But is the private ownership, per se, in and of itself, possible with collective product, uh, appropriation of the surplus? By the producers, yeah. So if you like private ownership, sure. Next, is it possible to have private markets? Why not? There's no necessity to have planners stepping in and saying, what shall be the value of labor power? What shall be the value of a car? Or anything else in society? You could have impersonal market forces determining prices all over the place. And competition amongst these communist workers. And of course, you know, it's going to occur to you since we already did it in class. Is it then possible to have business cycles? Absolutely. Unemployment? Yes. Unequal income? Yes. The communist fundamental class process is not, and never was intended to be, by any of these individuals, but it's not. Nirvana is not utopia. It's not the Garden of Eden. It's a society. It has contradictions like any other society. They're of a different sort. It's accomplished one radical major altering, which is the establishment of a collective production and appropriation and distribution of surplus. You have no idea why Marx went after that then. He was aware of the power issue, he was aware of the property issue, he was for sure aware of the income. He didn't have much to add on those things. People had worked on that before his time, and they've been working on it ever since. What he had to add was this one. That's his entry point. That's what he wanted. It's not that he wanted to diminish or erode these other contributions, but rather he wanted to say, no, understand property ownership in connection to who produces and who appropriates the surplus. Yes, sir. I keep cutting you off. Yes. Okay. Um, so you said you have private ownership of the means of production. Yes, sir. What's the point if you're not getting any surplus value? I'm sorry. If you what are you getting out of adding the ownership of the means of production if you don't get any surplus value? See, before you can get a cut for your ownership, you have to have the surplus. Yes. Right. Good. So what? What Marx is asking then is. Who produces and appropriates and distributes the surplus? See, see, if, if I give you a candy bar and I say, pass that candy bar to the person next to you, you know, 
to the left of you. In order for you to pass it, you have to first have it. What Marx is concerned with, and what these other characters should have been concerned with, is the having of the candy bar. That's not diminishing the distribution because he would have a candy bar. But what it, you can't distribute until you have. And the question becomes, who's got it? So, who got the service? Okay, so you're saying that the workers have the surplus, right? Yes, so they collected it. As a collectively. So you're saying you can still have private ownership of the means of production, but why would you own anything if you're not getting any surplus out of it? So let me do it again. Okay, let me let me try again, okay? Let me try again, okay. So let's assume in the example I have here that um, the private ownership gives uh, uh, Whoever will have the private owners, let's say, I don't know, $100 million. Okay, is that? So if you own privately the means of production used here, you get $100 million in dividends. Uh, okay. okay, so you still get the dividends. That's separate. Yeah, you still get your dividends. But in order to get the dividends, you need a what? You need workers. I understand that. Workers give you what? Good. So they, they pay the dividends. You pay it out of what? Surplus. So the question is, who gets the surplus? You're saying the worker would get the surplus. And what they do? What would they do with their one million? They would have to do what? Pay it to the government. Yeah, but I mean, just in terms of your question, they would have to pay, pay it to the capitalists. The owners. How much? Yeah, hundred million. That would be our reason. Let me do it again because it's not clear to you. So I assume your average. Let me do it again. Let's do it again. <laughs> Look, what's the sense of me just going on? He doesn't get it. No. Should I ask you? I go around, give you a quiz. My guess is he's not alone. Let's have private ownership in this system in which the individuals privately own the means of production. Let's be clear what they own. They own and all the tools and equipment. So if this corporation uses that stuff, it uses it up. And so your ownership gets eroded because they're using it. So you want to be compensated for your ownership of that stuff, whoever you got. You, know, you might have saved, it might have been given to you by your parents, whatever you get. But you won't win it privately, we have the laws. So you want to be properly compensated for using up the means of production to produce this product. And we respect that in society, we have the laws that say, okay. So you say to the workers who receive that surplus, we want 100 million. The workers say to you, no, that's too much. We'll give you 50. And you work out 75, just like in capitalism, that's no different. For them to give you 75 million, or 100, or 50, whatever it is, they have to have a surplus to begin with. That's you giving the lollipop to him, you've got to have the lollipop in your hands. For Marx, he's concerned with who first gets and distributes the lollipop. That's this. Too much attention has been spent on the distribution without worrying about how you get it. So, the, in order to distribute, you would have to receive. And so what he's after is that the workers should receive the surplus, and it's, you know, what they do with it is very interesting. But they'll be in the position to distribute that which they receive. They don't have that luxury, that right in capitalism. So what's the incentive to do anything to know? Well, the owners might say, if it's private ownership, it's respected under the law. Let's follow the logic. It's a different in the United States than in this society. If we have ownership and the law, the uh, owners, you, might, you know, whoever it is, the owners might say, you can't have my means of production. And if it's shares of stock, they might vote the workers out, they may talk about revolution. You would have a tension in society, in communism. Communism is not the end, the, the end of tensions. They might say to the, it's like the managers might say, or the state might say to the workers, if you don't give us our taxes, if you don't give us a dividend, um, if you don't give us a salary as a manager, 
you got a problem. We'll march in the streets. We'll get rid of you. We'll institute capitalism. So the establishment of communism is fraught with all kinds of problems, and out of that could come a transition to a different class structure. Hence, the workers always have to be aware of this, and someone has to teach them that. That if they don't distribute the surplus appropriately, they can lose their position to distribute the surplus. This requires a sophistication and a nuance on their part which is every bit as sophisticated and nuanced as under present U.S. capitalism. If a board of directors doesn't give a cut of the surplus to its owners, those board of directors may disappear. The owners may get rid of them. But I taught you something else. We've done a lot of schools. I taught you we may have tax laws under capitalism in which the owners do not want a dividend. They want an increased share price. It's possible under communism, you could have not only private ownership, but you could have a stock market. And the owners are not interested in getting dividends. What they want is a higher price of stock, because that gives them a potential capital gain. Hence, they say to the workers, don't give us dividends. Our incentive is grow your communist companies. So our share of stock will grow, and we'll do better. However, this doesn't end, it just goes on and on. If there's a stock market where you can buy and sell these shares, some people are going to lose and some people are going to gain. That's a market. And some individuals in communism could take their shares of stock, which gives them ownership, and make them a state. And that introduces an inequality of income and wealth, which could in turn jeopardize communism. People get angry and upset. That's the risk. So you have a different society, it doesn't alleviate risk, the tension, the contradictions, the struggle. That's that's life. It's just different kinds of risks and struggles. Let's do the market, which you didn't ask me. I could ask that about the market too. It, it, let me just put one more. Uh, it, un, it's unfortunate. Engels thought that collective ownership would end all these problems. It didn't. It didn't in the Soviet Union, it didn't in East Germany, it didn't in Poland, it didn't in any of these countries, China. They passed the laws, but it didn't end the problems. <coughs> Problem being that the state bureaucrats still got the surplus produced by those workers. And that class exploitation not at these societies, even though they had collective ownership. Did the workers there get returns for they Oh my god, did they? I want to remind you something about you know, the social dividends in terms of what people got in the Soviet Union. This was a relatively underdeveloped country, devastated after World War I by the 1930s, which was a fairly advanced industrial country with a tremendous public goods. Let's take the market. Suppose these companies are producing for the market. So the workers are getting the surplus, but it is the economics of the society, the economic structure, so that they produce commodities they produce for exchange. As I've shown you now, it's possible to get a business cycle. You have to go back in your notes. Okay, when we did that, is to have a business cycle in this. That is the profit rate of fall. And so the communist factories would start laying off their workers, and you could have unemployed communist workers. Might those communist workers then say, that's screw this kind of society. I am no longer, and I don't have the possibility of being an appropriator and distributor of surplus, because I don't produce it anymore. I'm unemployed. I am alienated from this society. I want it over. Of course it's possible. Let's make sure I get the point across. Let's switch for a moment. The next guy is very good at this. Nobody did want to study. Suppose we have planning. 
showing there's no solution here either. Suppose we have planning. What that means is that the communist workers give a cut of the surplus, not to merchants now, private merchants, they give them to planners. And the planners establish the prices of all the inputs and all the outputs. That's what planning means, the absence of the market. Can you have problems in that society? Are you kidding? That was the history of the so-called socialist world. You can have an enormous amount of power concentrated in very few hands, and the inability of a few planets, maybe two or three thousand people in the former Soviet Union, to ever figure out what would be the appropriate prices. They just couldn't do it. It's too complicated. So they had all kinds of problems. Not producing enough consumer goods, they're producing too many tractors. Tractors rusting in the fields, and people thirsting for consumer goods. Did planning create problems? Are you kidding? Both of these systems create problems. The distribution of wealth is fraught with problems. There's no nirvana here either. In communism, you get the business cycle. What then do the workers do? To avoid the risk, like we just went through, to avoid the risk of the private owners getting upset and get rid of them, they might give a dividend to them, or a higher price in terms of growth of the companies, communist companies. What might they do in the case of the market if there's unemployed labor? You think of anything. No. By the way, what do capitalists in the United States do when we have unemployment? In the United States now, we have officially almost 10%, we've had it for the last three years, unofficially 20% of the people are unemployed. That, that goes back to the 1930s. So maybe it doesn't touch you, but it touches many, many Americans. 150 million people in the workforce, 150 times 30 million Americans. So what do capitalists do so we don't have a revolution in the United States when faced with this enormous unemployment pool? Yeah? More government spending. I can't hear you. More government spending. Something. Yes, before you have more government spending, that's sophisticated. What law do we have in the United States to deal with unemployment? When you get unemployed, yeah? Okay. Well, it's not called welfare. Yes, sir. What is it called? Does anyone know? Yeah, man. It's called, yes, sir, unemployment compensation. Or as you said, benefit. It's a kind of welfare, what you said. Which is what? The employers in the United States, in every single state in the United States, under the law, have to take a cut of their surplus and pay a tax to the state to set up an unemployment fund to potentially pay the workers if they get unemployed. That's how it's handled in the United States. And then they have so many weeks, whatever it is, 30 weeks, something out, one year of unemployment benefits, that's a tax on the surplus. That's what would have to be done if it were a market economy in communism. I'll see you next time.